Hello, Innovation Experimenters. Thank you for joining in with today's session. My name is Edward Pollock, and I am going to take you through this journey on how we test and innovate our ideas. Today, I'm dressed, ready to explore and experiment all sorts of ideas. Don't worry, I don't need to wear these the whole time. Um, hopefully, you are ready to explore your ideas, whether you're looking to set up a business or you're just trying to come up with something different. We're going to give you some tools and techniques today that will give you some practice, some practical tools, some things you can do to figure out if your ideas are any good. Um, my name is Edward. I'm Innovation Manager in Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group. Um, if you have any questions throughout the session, feel free to pop them in the chat and hopefully um, we will give you a good start. So as you know, the topic today is learning from innovation experiments and um, why you should be testing to users, talking to users and running tests to launch your innovations. Um, so the first thing we're going to explore in today's session, let's have a look is when you think of innovation and you think of new ideas and you think of those moments where you come up with something different, you're probably familiar with this, the Archimedes, the um, philosopher thinking, Eureka, in the bathtub, the idea just came, you just discovered something. But innovation isn't always that simple and ideas don't always just appear out of nowhere. And um, we actually um, take a journey to go on them and we have to test them and evolve them and develop them. So there's a bit of a misconception here around the Eureka moment, although many people might have um, that initial spark where something got started. Um, and Pablo Picasso once said that they begin with an idea and then it becomes something else. We've got to be prepared for it to evolve and change. And that's what experimenters do. We have our hypothesis and we use tools to evaluate and explore what that could become um, as we evolve through that process. And innovation is not a straight line. You're going to start at this early starting point and you're going to loop around and you're going to change your idea and you're going to evolve, whether, as I say, you're looking to launch the next big business venture or perhaps you're just interested um, in a new way of working in your employment or dealing with a challenging situation at home. Again, new ideas come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And it is this crazy squiggle of a diagram that hopefully can give you a little bit of clarity as you move further through the innovation process. So today we are gonna be innovation experimenters. We're gonna be exploring how you can lever different tools. So hopefully you're sitting there like me and um, perhaps with your your lab goggles on, ready to be reflective. Um, safety precautions are advised because when you are asking people uh, for their input to ideas, you're not always going to get answers that you like. So you're going to have to be a bit resilient um, to challenge and to differences of opinion um, as you're going through your business idea. Um, so let me just spotlight myself so that everyone can see. So let's have a look at the first step, which is going to be experimenting with customers. Who are the people that you're going to be having an audience with? So wherever your idea comes from, the first two steps of getting the right idea is number one, having a clear problem, having a clear problem that you're trying to solve an issue, whether that is being able to communicate with people and needing a mobile phone um, through to um, having to deal with dirty teeth and having a toothbrush. It's not about the solution, it's about the problem. And then the second thing you need to have before you get to this point is an idea of your customer, a key specific audience that you're gonna target with. Um, and the first step in experimenting is testing that idea with the customers. Because an idea in your head might not just exist in everybody else's. If you do have a eureka moment where you think, wow, here's where an idea has come. Often innovations come from desperation, you're facing a frustration or a problem, maybe you've discovered something by accident, maybe you have come across something through meticulous research, but that's a process of you. Maybe it's your team, but still it's you, it's in your head. But that doesn't mean it's in everybody else's head. That doesn't mean that their interpretation of the problem is exactly the same as yours. So the first experiment is to make sure that all of these other faces that you're interacting with, the people who will eventually buy your products or service or will eventually use your innovation also face the same problem and you can learn a huge amount here often when you're a new business or a new innovator the first step you think about is you know do people like my idea do they want it but actually um, your for first focus should be on learning should be on trying to learn as much as possible from people because that's what researchers ex innovators experimenters are doing they're learning um, and this is part of the process that we know as design thinking. You may have come across this. Our last innovation um, skills uh, skill session was on this process. So as I say, by this point, 
You should have an understanding of who the people are and what their problem is. You should have figured out specifically what you are trying to target. So speaking to children about brushing their teeth, about the dirt on their teeth, then you can start to ideate and come up with solutions. It could be a toothbrush, could be a toothpaste, could be a mouthwash, all sorts of things. And now these steps, the testing and the experimentation come from this proto prototyping and testing, figuring out if the idea really is going to work for that audience. And then you keep looping around infinitely, going around and around, coming up with new ideas and continuing to test them. So with customers, we're figuring out, we think that customers have a particular problem. We think we know what that problem is. We think this solution could work. And now the question is, does it? And would the customer genuinely care or not? And a good cartoon here that I think is particularly useful is experimenters here in the lab. Talk to customers. What do customers have to do with the products we eventually want them to buy? Now, that is a problem that faces many innovators and probably many entrepreneurs. It's that they have this brilliant idea and they're so wedded on making it happen that actually they never speak to the people who they want to sell it to. And then they launch their amazing business. It's going to revolutionize the world and nobody buys it. And it's all down to this challenge of talking to customers. And it's the step that so many entrepreneurs skip, so many innovators skip, because it's the hard thing to do. It's uncomfortable. I am guilty of this myself. When I launch a new program or project, it's really difficult to go out there and talk to people about it. Um, but it's a fundamental. So how do you do that? How do you go through that process of what we call customer discovery? So there's two stages. There's customer discovery, which is all about learning. It's in the word discovery. You're learning, you're investigating, you're exploring, you're figuring out the, the mind and the intention and the interests of the person you want to sell to. Um, but then you've got customer validation, which is really checking and testing your assumptions and your ideas. And another nice little cartoon here where it's a bunch of men in an office coming up with ideas with the pizza, with the drinks, having a great old time, classic situation for many entrepreneurs. Um, and they're having a conversation and they're saying, if I were a teenage girl, target market, I would love our new pro project. Have you talked to any teenage girls to make sure? And what? Lead this room. How much entrepreneurship happens in closed, isolated rooms with people who aren't the customer? If you're designing something for children, for um, other students, get out there and talk to them. And um, there's a, an entrepreneurship um, author um, called Steve Blank, who has a famous quote that is, get out of the building. Now, obviously, COVID restrictions apply, et cetera, et cetera. But getting out of the building and talking to customers is uh, pretty critical to this process of innovating. So how do we do this? How do we do this experimentation of talking to customers? Well, the steps I've outlined here will hopefully give you a starting point. So number one, what are your assumptions? Write them out. What are you assuming that you know about the customer and what they want? So maybe you're assuming that um, depending on what your idea is. Say that your idea is a creative way of helping children brush their teeth. You're assuming that children, A, brush their teeth, that um, they currently have struggles with it, whatever kind of assumptions you're coming up with, you map them all out and you can start to figure out which ones are really critical. Some of them are going to be obvious, but write them out anyway. Some of them, yes, we know that's real, but some of them are just your assumptions, you know, that you're just making a guess that you really need to figure out. Step number two is make sure you know who your ideal customers are and identify who you want to exactly talk to. Figure out what you need to know and what kind of questions you might potentially ask them. Figure out how you're going to ask them and what type of experiment you might end up doing. Outline what they are going to say and make some notes on it and then figure out how that's going to impact your business or your idea or your concept or your project. And all of these um, iterations can help you with that. So step number one is figuring out those assumptions. So this is a tool called the Business Model Canvas. It's a great way of mapping out a business idea. So you can map in things like we assume that, you know, this audience wants our product, for example. We assume that children want toothbrushes, for example. And we assume that the channel that they would buy them in is supermarkets, not the internet. We maybe assume that um, the price needs to be at this point. We assume that it needs to be this particular material. And um, again, these are things that you're just guessing, but actually you want to test to figure out if that is the right way. So for example, are people buying toothbrushes in supermarkets rather than online? 
We don't know. So that's a little mini experiment that we can start to look at and say, well, why don't we ask some customers or have a look at their buying behaviors or see what they're actually doing and before we make a decision. And um, if you were put in front of, I guess, a court case and had to argue the validity, yes, your honor, I hereby validate that my business idea is succinct. Do you have the evidence to back up your claims? If you were challenged to say, how do you know that this audience wants your product? Most entrepreneurs actually don't have an answer and don't know what to say. And so that's step number one, map out those assumptions. So that could be things like if we were launching something in our department, entrepreneurship and innovation, we might say, for example, some assumptions are that our GU students and staff are interested in hearing from entrepreneurial guest speakers. I just assume that. Maybe I need to go out there and talk to students and staff. Before I start booking lots of guest speakers, I should go out there and figure out, do they care? Maybe they would rather hear from other people. Another assumption is that RG students and staff are willing to stay late in the evening to attend a guest lecture. For example, we've got one coming up on Monday. Um, how do I test that? Again, I need to figure that out. If I put an event on at that time, I don't know if that's going to work or not. Number three, email is the most effective way of communicating with students and staff. That's an assumption I've made about the channels. Um, so we have to try and figure out, is, is that appropriate? Maybe there's other sources that are better. Um, social media, um, uh, posters, you know, apps, all sorts of other things. Number four, and another assumption might be big name speakers are more important than an interesting topic. Again, I need to test that perhaps. And number five, the biggest motivation to attend an event is to uh, a desire to start a business. So if I was planning something, these are my assumptions for a situation that I would be in. So you would have to do your own test to figure out if they are appropriate or not. And a way you could do this is a tool called a test card. So this is a, a material from Strategizer. You could print off loads of these and essentially you outline your hypothesis. We believe that, and you could put something really specific like, we believe that RGU students and staff are interested in hearing from entrepreneurial guest speakers. To verify that, we will conduct conversations with 50 um, or so um, students at the RGU campus and measure, step three, whether more than 70% of them agreed with this statement. And, and we are right if more than 70% of them agree with this statement. So um, you can start to map out lots of different mini experiments that you can use when talking to customers. And you can have all of these test cards lined out um, to figure out, are you getting the answers you want? And you might find something back. So if I spoke to students, and I have made this assumption and launched our masterclass series. And actually, when I spoke to students, they said, well, we don't want to stay late in the evening. We would much rather do it over lunchtime. Well, actually, that would change my business and it would make my business better because I'd listened to the customers and I tested that assumption. Whereas in most cases, I would just plow right ahead, launch my masterclass series in an evening and just see what happens but actually having tested it i can pivot it i can change it and i can make the idea better so that's a test card a useful tool you can use and an important thing to distinguish is that you need to have a, a focus for your customers so many entrepreneurs have this vision that anyone could be my customer i'm happy to launch my innovation so that it can help anyone in the whole wide world it could be grandparents it could be babies it could be penguins all sorts of different groups when really you're going to have a geographical limit, you're going to have possibly an age limit, you're going to have an interest limit. So you really need to start figuring out who's going to be most interested in this concept earlier. And those are the people you need to start talking to um, and get some right information. Otherwise, you'll get, I guess, false positives or um, false negatives. You'll be asking the wrong people and you'll get all this useless information. I mean, it's all useful, but it's not particularly going to help you if they're not the people you want to buy your products and services in the first place. So if you're designing something like a children's tooth product, you should probably talk to children and their parents, not people without children or just random people on the street asking them about their opinion of children's toothbrushes because they don't know it firsthand. They don't have that experience. So next step is to target your ideal customers and to realize that your target market is not everyone. Target is a specific phrase. Your potential market could be everyone, but you need a target market, a really specific focus, the people you're designing your innovation for. And there are two sides that you may want to consider in this process of testing. Maybe you're developing a solution that is you might want to sell to businesses. 
So there are two sides. There are users and there are customers. So the user is the person who is going to who faces the problem you're trying to solve, who's going to use the end product and who you're designing for. A lot of the time, the user and the customer is the same. But in some cases, the customer is the person with the money, the person who will pay for the product or service, who you need to create the value for and sell to. So they might have slightly different needs. Um, a great example is the toothbrush example. A children's toothbrush is used by children, but they're not the customer. The parents are the customer. So maybe a child, if you only ask the user for their opinion, the child would say, yeah, I want it to have crazy flashing lights and I want it to have super noisy things and I want it to be rechargeable and have all this app, blah, blah, blah. But actually, for the customer, the parent who's buying it at the end of the day, the last thing they want is a super noisy gadget that's going to annoy them. So you need to keep them both satisfied. You need to understand both of their perspectives and run experiments on both. Another example is toys. The user of a toy is a child. The customer is the adult. The user of an engineering solution might be the oil rig workers. The customer would be the procurement manager for the oil and gas company. So you have to satisfy both of their needs. And often entrepreneurs only test their idea with users. They think, I'm going to create this piece of software, which is going to be great for oil and gas rig workers, and they're going to love it. And they build it and they develop it and it solves a great problem, but they've completely forgot that it's the management, it's the organization, it's the company that needs to buy it. And all of a sudden the company's thinking, well, actually, this doesn't bother us. It's going to cost us money and not save us any money. So why would we be interested? Yes, it might make our engineers slightly happier, but is it worth the price? No. All of a sudden, you've put in this huge amount of work. You've got a potentially really happy user base but no customers because the companies won't buy it. So you need to do experiments with both users and customers, the people with the money and the people with the product to make sure that you have a really valuable idea. Ask those questions, have those conversations. So the next thing to have a look at is identifying those customers, having a target list and making an outline of who you're going to talk to. If you're gonna do these experiments, who do you wanna to speak to? Um, and again, find a really tangible list of who that's going to be and um, put their names down on a piece of paper if you can, and you can narrow it down or broaden it out. So if we were doing something for like an entrepreneurship event, we might say we can target people on this workshop. We could target um, people who have applied to our programs in the past, or we could target anyone doing entrepreneurship modules. And then it gives us this wider base. So you can figure out really specifically the smallest group you could possibly target and start having those conversations. So then once you've got an idea of the problem, the customer, and uh, what they're going to be needing, what the assumptions that you need to test are, you can then figure out what you're going to ask. So this is uh, the critical information you need to gain. You might prioritize which assumptions are most important, and you design your questions to make sure they are open and clear. If your answer could end in a yes or no question, uh -uh, that is not a good experiment because um, you're really um, not going to get the rich answers. You're here to learn. You're inquisitive. You're, again, scientists with your magnifying glass investigating the subjects of people. Um, and that's what you're trying to explore. It's not just about getting the answers that you want to hear. So do you like this product? Yes. Not a good answer. Um, Tell me about a time when you face the problem around brushing your teeth, or can you tell me about the last time you brought a similar product, or how do you currently solve this problem? How frustrating is this problem for you? Are big, open, rich questions that focus um, on the problem and on the person. Another big mistake that entrepreneurs and innovation experimenters make when they do this is that they focus on themselves. They come in and it's all about me. Oh, hello, I'm here. I'm developing this business. Do you like my idea? I've worked on this. I think it should be this. And it's all about them. The questions all revolve around my idea, my business, my concept is this. And if the customer says, you know, whatever feedback they've come up with, um, the interviewer, the um, entrepreneur suddenly turns that all around to them. Or, or I've seen what you've done with that experience. I thought of that idea. Oh, oh we've been working on that. That's not how you should conduct this because it makes it, for the person who's being interviewed for your customer, they don't care. They're not interested in what you're saying. It's clearly all about you. All that you want to hear is that we love your idea. 
great well done congrats to you um a really honest experiment a good experiment is that you are genuinely interested in the other person you have to put aside any notions about what you want to design forget about the product and focus on the problem really ask rich questions that interest the customer. I'm really interested to hear more about um, your previous experience with products like this. Um, can you tell me about a time when, you know, can you give an example of when was the last time you did this and learn as much as you can. Suddenly, if you make it all about the other person, it's great. The other caveat is to be careful of the concept of why. Why questions can come across as quite accusatory. Uh, I don't know if I said that right, but um, if someone says, why did you do that? It can feel a bit affronted. Even if it's a genuinely nice question, you can feel a little bit, oh, why are you accusing me of doing something bad? So be careful of the why question when you're conducting these innovation experiments. And you need to figure out the best way to do this. Um, a real genuine conversation is the absolute best way. Again, another quick cheat that most entrepreneurs do if they're asked to do this and they're developing an idea and they do research, survey. Stick a survey monkey out. And what happens? They say on a scale of one to 10, how much do you like this idea? And you're preempting the question, you're telling the customer what you want the answer to be and the data is pretty much useless. A good survey would have to have those big open questions, would have to have text boxes. Can you provide an example of or, you know, ranking their their um, experience of the problem or, you know, finding a way of not um, offering leading questions. Um, surveys can be useful slightly later on once you know as much as you can from the customer's problem and you're really just talking about specific things like price points or sales channels or features. Once you've got that, then maybe a survey is okay. But in these early stages of really understanding the customer, a survey is a difficult tool to use. Um, so outline your questions at this point in this experiment. So figure out um, what are your ambitions or interests? What makes you feel inspired? Figure out what type of questions you think will be useful um, and map them all out so you're ready to conduct those innovation experiments. When you're doing these interviews, try to start as broad as you possibly can and make the customer feel um, welcome or comfortable. Again, use it as well. Ask them um, about the big experience of the problem. And as you get closer to the end of your experiment, you can then start bringing in your solution to say, well, actually, we've started looking at this option. And what do you think of it? Do you like this feature? How would this um, how would you like to use this product or service? That could be helpful near the end. So once you've done these experiments, and of course, you should be doing dozens and dozens of these, whether you're developing a new idea in your department, in which case go and speak to your colleagues and speak to the users in the department or other people who've been there before, whether you're developing a new business, go and speak to your customers and outline, did they agree with the assumption? Was there anything unexpected about the answers? Did they care as much about the problem as you thought they did? That's a massive question, because yes, someone might have the problem you're talking about, like it is difficult to know how long I've brushed my teeth for, but would they be willing to spend an extra 20 pounds on a toothbrush if it had a little timer on it? No, it's not that important. I can, I can keep count of it myself. I'm not gonna spend any extra on it. So actually you're learning that maybe not all problems are as important to each person. And then go back to your idea and change things and update it and be a good scientist and change the hypothesis and go through it. Um, it's okay for your idea to evolve. That is the whole point. And the second part of the test card, you can also now capture the learning card, which is after each conversation, you can fill in one of these blue ones that says, we thought that students would be willing to stay late after um, university. We observed that um, of the students that we asked, they were less likely to want to stay late or they said that they wanted to stay late, but actually as soon as they could get on the bus at three o'clock, they did. And we learn that and therefore we will, what action would you take? So it's a great way of capturing the results of some of those experiments, much easier than a lab report if anyone has done science. And um, so hopefully that's quite helpful. And you can also keep a spreadsheet where you track down who the customer was, notes of what you learned and things you might change as a result of it. And um, the more meticulous and structured you are, the absolute better results you're gonna get from your business idea or your innovation. So that's our first type of experiment is, is talking to customers and the process of conducting that. 
But there's a couple of tips I want to give you when you're going about doing this. And that is about asking the right questions. And I think I've got two videos that can briefly show you what a good question is and what a bad question is. So let's have a look at what it might look like to ask the right question. And one of the tips is, as I've said before, making sure you move from talking about your product and trying to sell. This isn't about selling your product at this point. This is about learning. So focus on the customer and what they care about. Working on a mobile app to help people track their diet. So are, are you generally a healthy eater? Oh yeah, I'm a really healthy eater. I love vegetables and fresh produce. So yeah, super healthy. Okay, great. Thanks for your time. Oh, okay. So that was the wrong way to ask questions. A straight, blunt answer. Do you, are you a healthy eater? Yes or no? And uh, easy answer, move on. Now let's have a look at a better way that we can ask that question. Working on a mobile app to help people track. Hi, Karina. Thanks for taking the time to talk. Yeah, sure. I'm working on a mobile app to help people track their diet. Would you say you're generally a healthy eater? Oh, yeah. I'm a really healthy eater. I eat a lot of vegetables and fresh produce. Um, very healthy. That's great. So can you tell me what you ate yesterday? Um, well, yesterday I had uh, coffee for breakfast and then um, I was pretty busy, so I skipped lunch and, and I was tired when I got home, so I ordered in pizza. Okay. What about earlier this week? Um, let's see. Well, I mean, this week wasn't a very good week for me. So, I mean, I think I had fast food on Monday. Um, and then I had like a burger on Tuesday. And then yet. Yesterday. Okay. So if this week was a bad week, what about the week before that? Um, well, the week before that was more, more mixed. Yeah. I, I think I might have gone pizza again um, one, one day. But um, some of the other days were better than that, than that one. Like, what'd you eat on the good days? Um, let's see. Well, I think I had some roast chicken on Monday uh, for dinner. And then on Tuesday, well, we ate out. It was someone's birthday. So uh, I think I had some meatloaf. And then for dinner, I had a um, sandwich. You, oh, yeah, I always have dessert. There's dessert, too. So a slightly different approach there, and hopefully you can spot some of the differences. So while they asked about the healthy eating, when the um, interviewer then picked apart, maybe she has a different impression of herself than uh, she thought. She thinks she's a healthy eater, but by asking those broader open questions about, tell me about what you last ate, fast food, meatloaf, sandwich, coffee for breakfast, oh, and always dessert, maybe you're getting a slightly different answer. Would this customer actually use your product or service? Possibly not. And if you put that in a survey, they would give you, yes, I am a healthy eater. Great. This 100% of customers surveyed said they were healthy eating. Therefore, all of them will buy our products and services. Yay, give us the money. It's all great. But if you genuinely picked into what they were saying and what they believe, maybe not as healthy eating as you think. And maybe you can pick up on some um, kind of, points that you could develop your app a little bit further on and um, to try and make it better for this particular customer. So some top tips there and um, some myths. Here are some common answers we get. Uh, again, I'm guilty of this. The concept of going out and talking to people is a bit intense um, and startups, innovators almost always avoid it. And here are the reasons that we have and um, that come back. So number one, I can't find my customers. If you're saying that when you're asked to go away and talk to customers, then if you can identify the people who are interested in your idea to talk to before you launch it, why are you launching it? Because what's going to happen when you have your product or service and you need to try and actually sell it to them? We get this a lot with companies or entrepreneurs or innovators who are trying to sell to businesses. Um, I can't talk to the person in BP or Shell or whoever it is that I want to talk to about my oil and gas technology solution. Well, if you're struggling to get in at this point, which is understandable, is the demand really there in the place that you thought it was? So you need to pivot your customer audience. You need to find a group of customers that you can interact with, that you can engage with, because you will eventually need to talk to them to sell your products. Or the other version is I am the customer. So I don't need to talk to anyone else because I face this problem. We look at ourselves in the mirror and we try to define what our products or services should be. And while that's a great place to start, yes, maybe you have had that pain or experience, 
you can't sell the product only to you and every individual person, even if they have somewhat similar experiences, hasn't got the exact same interpretation of the problem as you do. And um, so you need to be able to have um, a wider viewpoint to make sure it's viable, that you can sell it to multiple people. You are not the expert in um, one particular problem or area. So you need to make sure that for other people, they also have that same experience and that same um, challenge as you possibly do as well. Another myth that we often see is my product isn't ready yet, so I cannot go and talk to people. Yes, this is a big challenge that entrepreneurs have. And again, I'm holding my hands up. I'm guilty of this one. This one is that um, we are a bit perfectionists. If you're developing an idea, maybe you want your website to be great or you want your logo to look good. Or, you know, what if, what if I talk to someone who might be my customer one day and my email address doesn't look fancy enough or I don't have a really good pitch yet? And it's an easy, natural way to put yourself off um, defining if you're um, going to talk to customers and conduct that experiment. But you need to be able to learn that there's never going to be perfection. All of the big companies that you know today are constantly updating and iterating their products. So your product is never going to be ready. And you need to be comfortable with asking questions, with talking to customers. And you don't need to necessarily um, give too much away about your products or services straight away. You might be able to um, initially um, just talk about the problem. Say, I'm developing an idea, but I'd like to talk to you about your problem or I wish you could help me with something. Don't underestimate the power of the word help. If you're conducting these experiments and talking to customers, just ask for help. Be a genuine human and you'll be surprised at how much hopefully positive reaction you get because this is all part of the designing process to come up with the best ideas possible. And another myth that we see from entrepreneurs or innovators looking to talk to customers is that I've already spoken to my customers. I don't need to do this. Um, oh, I did this in, when I was doing my coursework project. I already spoke to customers. There's no stopping point. There's no, I finished it. It needs to keep happening, keep going. As you, as you come up with your ideas, you develop your first prototype, as you launch your website, as you launch your logo, constantly be sending it out to people so that they can, they can see it, so they can comment. Um, speak to some more, see if you can get updates on them, dig deeper into their behaviors and see if you can get some insight. Um, and it will help you with your selling at some point because keep those relationships going and maybe someday down the line, it'll be easy to sell to them. And the, uh, another top tip in this is don't listen to just what you want. This is called confirmation bias. And it happens a lot of the time when you're doing these little experiments is you've got the fact about what the person says. I only occasionally go shopping in supermarkets and what you believe if they shop in supermarkets every day. And what you then interpret from that, so you have that conversation, you think, yes, they shop in supermarkets loads. But that's not exactly what the person said. Exactly what the person said was I occasionally shop in supermarkets. So actually that's a different interpretation. And you may find that the customer, the person you're interviewing, gives you the answer that you want to hear because they know that you are developing this idea. If you come in and say, I've been working on this business for a long time, I'm really passionate about it. This is what I care about. You know, tell me about this. They're gonna be uncomfortable giving you negative feedback. So you've got to avoid that challenge um, of um, only listening for the answers that you want to hear. So for these experiments, some top tips are try to only interview one person at a time. Have your goals and questions in advance. Get ready to hear things that you don't want to hear and be open to them. As I said, protection is helpful because you're going to hear ideas that are not comfortable and you've got to be ready to take it. Ask open-ended questions. Focus on behaviours and not feelings. So try to avoid intentions. Don't have should or could. If someone says, yeah, I might consider that or I'm, I could end up shopping there or I could buy that product, that's not particularly helpful. Ask questions about when was the last time? Can you tell me about a time? Get specific, genuine behaviours that you can then use to say, yes, they have actually done that. If they said they might or they, they maybe did, that's not helpful. Try to listen as much as you can and avoid talking. I'm bad for that one. Dig deep, ask for introductions to other people. So say, is there anyone else I could talk to? For those people who are struggling to find customers to talk to, even if you can get one, ask them, is there a colleague or a, or a family member that you think would also face the same problem that might benefit from a conversation? 
and try to capture some notes so that again, you're not interpreting things. If you're trying to remember what they said, you'll remember what you wanted to hear, not what they genuinely said. So find a subtle way to take those notes. If you want some resources on how to conduct these experiments in a really good way, and um, if you go to the entrepreneurship toolkit, the rgu.ac.uk forward slash entrepreneurship toolkit, there are two books there that you could get or you could buy them online. So one's called Talking to Humans, which gives some really great practical examples. And the other one is called The Mom Test, which essentially says, if you ask your mother or your father, if they like your idea, they will say yes, because they love you and you're their child. And essentially, you're not going to get genuine rich information. So some useful things. And um, it's quite a funny little book. It's really short. And um, but basically, it talks about when everyone is lying to you, which is genuinely in most conversations. And the top tip for this type of experiment is to do it now. Don't put it off. Do it as soon as you can and do it constantly throughout. So the last little section in this uh, uh, innovation skills, that's the main type of experiment that you should be conducting constantly, which is talking to customers. But there are some other types of user experiment that you can do to help you um, go further. So once you've kind of got a product or service, here's some other experiments you can do to test your idea. So for those who have a background in possibly computing, there's a process called, called Agile, which allows you to develop step by step through the process of developing an idea. And it's all about going through sprints. It's about looping through um, the different aspects of developing. So you start off by defining the requirements of what you need. So in theory, that is the problem. What are we trying to solve? You design something and you come up with ideas. You develop a prototype or a minimum viable product. You then test it. You ask people, you ask them to develop it. You deploy it out into you know, a test sample, and then you review it and you go back round and round and round and you do little sprints um, and develop your, your concept as many times as you possibly can. So an agile model could be quite helpful. In entrepreneurship, there's another model called the Lean Startup Methodology. Um, it's in a book called uh, The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. Um, and this is a cycle that's build, measure, learn. Build, measure, learn. So you build a, a quick dirty, cheap prototype of something. Um, it could be just a diagram. It could be a mock-up in cardboard. It could be a, a mock landing page. You build something quickly. You do not wait for it to be perfect. It's not going to be perfect. You go out there and you test it. You experiment. You learn. Um, you conduct um, uh, mini experiments with early adopters and you measure what you get from it and you learn. And then you do a thing called pivoting. So if the idea isn't working, if they're not using it the way that you wanted to, if they're not finding the buttons on the app as the way you thought they would, then you develop, you tweak it, you do it differently, and then you build it again. So instead of this massive long cycle of you know six months to come up with a product and you're building stuff and you're developing it, quick, really speedy cycles to try and develop those ideas as fast as possible. So how do we do that? How do we develop our actual prototype? So for websites, for apps, there's a concept called wireframing. And there's a few ways you can do that. If you're developing a website and you want to test it with customers, the very basic one is what you can see here. Draw it out. Literally draw box by box, frame by frame. If you've got a sort of spiral bound book like this, um, then you can have page one of the app here and you could do your different boxes and then you could literally pull it out in front of a customer and say, okay, this is our home screen, log in. Tell me what you would do and ask them to almost do the motions as if it was a phone and maybe look for what they might see is missing and take some notes. As soon as they push a button, click to the page. That is again, another mock-up of what that button would say. And then you push some buttons and see, and then just flip a page. And you don't need app experience. You don't need coding. So many students who are developing a website or an app are so convinced that they know what should be in there that um, they, end up not um, doing those tests, that they, they spend a huge amount of money and time getting uh, coders or developers to create something that actually, when the user gets it in the end, they don't even want it or need it. It's a bit of a challenge. So develop a wireframe. It could be, you also get digital versions now, so you can get user interface platforms that can make you essentially a mock-up. You could do it on PowerPoint, again, a little pretend phone or pretend app and get people to click the buttons and see what happens. It's not fully functional, but it gives you a lot of information about what people would expect to see. Are the boxes too big? Are the colors clear enough? Are the, 
you know, um, designs working. It's a simple experiment you could run, quickly test it, measure it, build it, change it, move the buttons, change the colors. Great solution to get your idea up to scratch. If you're doing a physical product, then if you can build a prototype, cardboard, 3D printing, um, you know, spare parts, and um, build a, a first sample of it, doesn't need to be perfect, and just see, see how do people hold it, how do people use it, um, do people understand what it is, can they see it, how does the design look, um, and go out there and test it with people and see what they say. Another type of prototyping is a storyboard. Can you map out what a customer would do? So maybe you're designing a service um, or a business process. So again, step by step, what does that storyboard look like? What kind of activities are happening? What kind of um, you know, behaviors are expected at all those different levels? Um, can be a useful tool to help you experiment and see, talk to customers about it, ask them about what their experience is like, and then you might see um, some different answers coming back. Another tool, as well as asking people questions, is essentially just observing them. So if you're asking someone to use your product, instead of asking them a bunch of questions about it, if you've got a prototype, just leave it in front of them and see what they do. Or you could um, watch people shopping in a supermarket. It was about toothbrushes. Watch people as they're shopping for toothbrushes. Do they read the labels on the box? Are they looking for things? And perhaps then once you've seen them do behaviors, you can go up to them and ask and say, I'm interesting to know why you chose that particular brand of toothbrush. What went into your consideration? Did you think of the price? Did the color matter? And learn from observing your customers and situations. And another tool is customer journey mapping where actually you map out start to finish all the touch points that you would have with that customer. And maybe you, you get a bunch of customers in a focus group and you ask them to tell them about the last time they bought a product like this or how they face that problem. And you can map out with post-it notes all the different steps. And again, it gives you a, a prototype and every group of customers will be slightly differently. Um, so you can learn from all of that experiences. Another one is A-B split testing. So this is where you do two slightly different versions. So you might have um, landing pages of a website perhaps. So you can maybe make a mock landing page and you could set up some social media adverts and you can name your business, um, you know, superstar toothbrushes on one, or you can call it pink princess toothbrushes on the other. And you can make really cheap landing pages and you can promote that out and you can see which ones get the most clicks, which ones get the most interactions, which name um, people are most interested in. And again, you can you know keep changing that and experimenting with it and seeing what you get back from it. Another experiment you could do is actually um, asking your customers to design something. So there's a few ways you could do this. You could literally um, ask them to design your product, get them in a room for half a day and ask them to design something. You could ask them to design packaging. And what can be useful about that is um, if you've got a product or a service, asking your customers to design the packaging and telling them, we want you to define what the most valuable parts of the product are, you'll suddenly get an impression as to all of the different elements that the customers value most. Maybe they'll make the this feature the biggest thing with big colors and big letters, or they'll make the picture bigger and they'll highlight the, say for example, it's the toothbrush, they might say um, eco-friendly plastic is the biggest thing they put on there. And you suddenly think, well, we didn't think that the plastic was so important to the customers. We thought the colors were most important, but actually, as we asked them to design the packaging, they thought the eco-friendly was the most important. So. Maybe we can change that. Again, a really clear and fun way to do an experiment it can teach you so much. We are not the experts in everything and we need to rely on customers. And as I say, so many small early stage innovators skip all of these steps when actually great innovations can capture all of these things. And uh, another one is things like dot voting. You can map out all of your features um, all of the things you would love your product to do, you can't build them all. You can't make them all happen. So ask your customers which ones are the most important to them. Ask them to vote or prioritize which features are of most value. You could do a, an example where you say, okay, here are 50 different features that our product might do, or maybe even just 10. You've got 100 um, pounds and you have to 
allocate the money on which features are of most value to you. You can either split it up evenly, you could give one all of it, you could give some none of it. And again, learn from the customers. If they were designing your product, if they were in your shoes, which things were of most value to them and see what you get back from that. Another way is test sales. So could you set up a mock product on your website or perhaps a crowdfunder and uh, your product doesn't exist yet? You've not got anything actually there. But the best way to test beyond intention, beyond someone just saying, yes, I'm interested in this, if you could get them to actually put in, you know, maybe fake card details or they can push a button to say they sign up for a waiting list, but, you know, as as if they're actually making a purchase, um, then you're really getting some traction. You will prove to your investors, we have 250 people on a wait list who've already prepaid, for example, like a crowdfunder for this product or service. This is why we need to launch it. One, you can generate revenue. Two, you can generate interest. And three, you can learn a lot from those customers because you know that they're genuinely interested. So test sales are a great way to go about doing some experiments. Crowdfunders are similar and um, where they say, we want to launch this product. Here's our concept. If we get 100% funding, then we'll be able to make it. If we don't get 100% funding and people aren't interested, then you've not wasted um, too much money by producing a product that the market doesn't want. And the final experiment idea that I've got for you today is ad tracking. Again, similar to the landing pages and the test sales is launching lots of different Google ads or social media ads and calculating the clicks, seeing what people click on, seeing how many interactions you get, seeing what geographical areas get the most interest. We get so much data with Google Analytics, with all the ad trackers, with social media ad trackers that can, again, help you target your markets. If you're developing a product, do some small ads in lots of different regions, maybe different areas of the country. And again, see what genders, see what areas are performing the best. And then you know that's where to invest your resources. Small, tiny amounts of money to help you build up a con an, an interest. If you're launching an innovation in an organization, sending out an email to lots of different groups and seeing which one gets the most responses or the most open rates, anything like that. Um, even just a big link that says I'm interested and in, all it does is, you know, go to a link tracker website. It's a great way to capture some of that data. So in a nutshell, innovation experimenters, I've hopefully taken you on a journey for how to test and develop great ideas. And the final thing, all of these experiments should be leading you to this. This is the uh, three zones of a great innovation. So from these experiments, you are challenged to try and come up with a way to make sure that your idea ticks these three boxes. One, is it desirable? Do customers want it? Do they care about it? Are they interested? Customer conversations are a great way. Observations, testing, making sure that the people you want to sell to genuinely care about what you're offering. Second one is feasibility. Can you actually make the product or service happen? Prototyping and wireframes, testing, all of that gives you a good sense of you know, the process of building. And when you prioritize different features, again, you'll get the sense of actually, we can't actually build that one. We don't have enough money. And the final one is viability. Can you make this business run? Can you earn enough money for it? And that's where maybe things like A-B split testing or mock sales or advanced sales or ad trackers, again, can let you know the price point. So perhaps your business model requires that um, you sell your product at a certain level. I was literally just before this talking to an RGU startup that sells their products for roughly £10. That's much higher than the market um, for their type of product, but that's how much it costs them to produce that product because they're doing it in a more eco-friendly, sustainable way. Viability, they will need to test that with different markets because for some groups, that's going to be too expensive for them. So if you can use experiments to craft this, to test, desirability, feasibility, and viability, then you will have that sweet spot in the middle that means you've got an innovative idea that can launch and be successful. So in a nutshell, that is me. My name is Edward Pollock. I'm Innovation Manager here at Robert Gordon University. I hope you have enjoyed learning a bit about innovation experimentation and you've got some practical tips that can help you go out there 
and launch great innovations. If you have any questions, please do get in touch at innovation at rgu.ac.uk. You can head to our website, rgu.ac.uk forward slash innovation. Next week is Global Entrepreneurship Week um, in November 2021. And we've got a bunch of enterprise skill sessions. And we also have an enterprise masterclass with um, Laurel and Aisho Quinn, who are the co-founders of an eco startup called Sustainably. So keep in touch with us on at RGU Innovation. We have a big announcement coming up next Monday. So I hope you are looking forward to that then. Until then, thank you for joining and taking time out of your day. I really look forward to um, speaking to you sometime very soon. And uh, I will hopefully um, see you at another event soon. Goodbye.